whether you use gallery view or speaker view is up to you. At times we will spotlight people when we're playing some games, yeah. And uh, you can think of this in the background. We will ask you later on to set up your Zoom so that people without their camera on are hidden. That lets us do smaller groups and sort of masterclass type stuff. So um, I think that's in the, in the settings online, but you can play around with that if you want to. Um, so uh, I'm gonna share my screen really quickly. We won't do very much. Um, I'm using Google Slides for the first time because it was the one piece of software we could agree on. Uh, we don't normally work together, Peter and myself. We're calling, um, we're calling this thing the, the Plays the Thing, which uh, if you can spot where it comes from, uh, you don't win a prize. Uh, it's a, a Shakespeare quote. Um, and it's about the thing that connects, I think, many of us in our work, or at least in our interest. Um, our background is in play as two different terms. One in terms of play as in games and play as in theatre plays. Uh, so we're going to come back to that later on. Let's introduce ourselves. Peter, do you want to go to the next slide? Yes, if it works, this Google thing. Play one, play two, here it is. Okay, so uh, you go first. Okay, yeah. Uh, my name is Peter. I have a background as a professional actor and dramaturg, as well as Master of Science, where, where I have also worked with change management within IT, actually. Uh, I work with theater, theater, as play, but also applied theater, applied impro, where I use it in organization for training managers, etc., for communication and, and team building. And I have my own little company called Interactor. And that's me, Adam. Cool. Thank you. So I'm Adam. Uh, you'll find me easiest on Twitter. I'm pretty active there, um, but also LinkedIn and places like this. Just Google my full name, Adam St. John Lawrence, and I'm the only one in the world who's called that, as far as I know. Um, and my background is, is a kind of a mixed one. Um, I come originally from psychology, then from developing automotive products in the motorcycle industry. Um, then I spent a long time as an actor, comedian, stripper, dancer, all these things, director, um, singer. And for the last few years, I've been in the field of design, mostly as a design educator. So what we're doing is we're helping large organizations to become more pragmatic about the way they work, uh, to do more research and more experiments and fewer PowerPoints and visions, yeah? Uh, so it's about design, not in the sense of aesthetics, but the sense of solving the problem right and making sure you're solving the right problem, yeah? Um, if you Google me, you'll find two large uh, events I'm involved in, or two large things. One is the Global Service Jam, which is the world's biggest uh, service innovation, customer experience event it takes place every year simultaneously in 100 cities around the world, a physical event usually. Um, and another thing is a book called This is Service Design Doing, uh, which I wrote with 305 colleagues. I was one of the four lead authors of that one. Okay, let's have a look at the play bill, Peter. Do you want to take us through this? First of all, we introduce ourselves, the players, which is us. That's what we do now. And we're going to talk a little bit about play, like plays versus play, to be playing. Uh, what, are, what are the differences there? Then we, we will talk uh, about how to apply play. So a view into the practice that we actually both uh, share in different ways, working with relations and play for relations and working with design and play for design, etc. And uh, then we're gonna invite you guys into some open space and let's play with it. Some different challenges, different uh, knowledge sharing. And um, yeah. That's the, uh, that's the structure so far, Adam. What are you uh, after plays, before play? I'd like yeah, to after that, we're going to try and say, okay, that. what could you do with this next? Uh, we're going to connect you to some communities or to some, uh, some sources on a very brief level, and to us, of course, so we can think about, okay, if I want to actually get more active with using this in my practice, what are my first steps, second steps to do that kind of thing? Yeah, so that's us. Um, we're going to start with a game, yeah? So uh, I did, Peter's gonna stop sharing his screen. Yes. And so you should have a plenary view. And this is actually one of the situations where it's quite helpful um, that uh, Zoom does not have us all in the same layout on screen, because although you may go over several screens, uh, depending on the, on the processing power of your computer, um, we don't all see the same people. So this thing works despite the fact we're spread across several screens. And again, if you've just joined us, there is a very 
warm invitation to work with your camera on today. If at all possible, please put your camera on so we can see your faces. Okay, so this is just a game. What we often do in our work is we do something and then we spend some time after that saying, well, what happened? What did we learn from that? What did we notice? Where can we use this kind of thing? What does it remind us of? Yeah. So a few times through this, we'll do stuff without explaining why. Please bear with us. And uh, then we will have some time afterwards, maybe, to reflect together or for you to reflect yourself on what was happening in that session. Okay. This is quite a big group for this one. Yeah. So we're going to try this, first of all, in plenary and see what happens. And then break you guys up into smaller groups and invite you to play the same game again in a spirit of curiosity. What's happening? What do I observe around me? Okay. So Peter, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, uh, it's just for everybody who's not, don't have their cameras on, for everybody else, you can actually hide people who don't have their cameras on. I mean, that can be... Um, do you know where the button is for that one? For the game? We'll figure so it out later. If you let's know get, how to do that. Let's get playing. Let's get playing. Let's get playing. Cool. So first of all, what we're going to do is a very simple impulse game. Is to, you know, wake up the brain. And normally we would do this in a physical space. So we do it here just to to wake up people and see what happens as a, as a game. So I'm just going to shout out a name and I'm going to throw a, vir a virtual ball to somebody here. So Olaf, I throw the ball at you. Olaf, here you are. And then you get it and you throw it to someone else. Okay, uh, Wolfgang. So thank you. And I throw the ball to Eza. And I throw the ball to Pierre. Now let's pick up the speed here, guys. Pick up the speed. <laughs> faster, faster, faster. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, I throw the ball to Anna Kira. Ooh, thank you. Throwing board to Sartak. Sorry. Pick it up. Pick it up. Pick it up. I, I throw the ball to Silvana. And I throw the ball to Klaus Show. Shh. I throw the ball to Jeff. I throw it to Fritz. Fritz, hold it for a second. Fritz, I want to pick this speed up. Yeah. I so all we hold on a second, Fred. Hold on a second, Fred. Hold on, hold. This I throw the ball to right now is slowing us down. Let's get rid of that. Let's keep the ball going fast just by using the name. Okay. So Fred, you have the ball. Where are you going to go to? Just Bernard. use the name. Peter. And uh, Hans. <laughs> and Adam. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Your mic's off. Yes, I know. Uh, <laughs> the ball to Olaf. Thank you, Anna, Kira. Mm, Klaus. Scott. Wolfgang. Pierre. <laughs> Jennifer. Wolfgang. Oh, um, <laughs> Hans. <laughs> Martina. <laughs> Jennifer. Jennifer? Scott. Adam. Thank you. Yay. Thank you very much. So you get the idea of the game. I'm not going to debrief it for now. Yeah. You might have noticed different people chose different strategies, reacted in different ways. What I'm going to do now is throw you guys, we're going to ask rather Pierre to throw you guys into random breakout groups. Yeah. Um, we didn't actually call anybody with their cameras off. We could have taken input with their cameras off as well. So I encourage you within the group to try that, see if that works as well, yeah? Um, and just play this for about one and a half minutes. Then we're gonna drag you all back again and together talk about what happened and what is this play thing and if this was playful or not for you. So in random groups, you can choose who starts, yeah? I suggest the person who starts is the one with the most beautiful background. Uh, if you wanna change your background, now's a good time to do it, yeah? And then um, play that game and we'll bring you back in one and a half minutes after you start. Okay. Okay, one and a half minutes. <clears throat> that's, that's rapid, right? Yeah, it's going to be a quick game. Let's give you two minutes because we're generous, but it's a okay. fast game. We get the speed up now. Excellent. In groups of around eight people. Okay, at three. One, two, three, open the rules. This is my favorite part. This is like in Star Trek when all the ships come out of warp, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> Now, when the Federation ship just like the Federation fleet shows up at wherever Deep Space Nine and <laughs> rescues everybody, that's cool. Yeah, I, I use just one sentence from Static comply. <laughs> <laughs> this bit, this bit. <laughs> I love that part. I love that part. 
So. The best lines from Star Wars. This isn't the Navy, it's just people. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. Fred's got the guitar out. Cool. Cool. Um, so, you just, a thing just happened. Yeah. And I'd like to do a little bit of a debrief here. We're going to use, initially, try and do this in the chat window. So, uh, bottom of your screen, there should be a chat icon. Yeah. And, uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to ask you a couple of questions around this. Yeah, thanks for introducing the game, Peter. Oh, Bernhard's got his Stormtrooper mask on. Fantastic I stuff. And I have Princess Leia behind me, so we're all in full Star Wars mode here. Uh, and an excellent harp. That's going to be the best harp in the background I've seen on Zoom. Thank you, thank you. That's entirely for posing reasons. Nobody in this apartment can play the harp. It's just there. Uh, <laughs> At least I'm honest. And rubber chickens. Okay, we're getting playful, you see. This is, in, this is what happens, okay? So I'd like to ask you guys three questions. Patrick's family is laughing. Fantastic. First question is, what happened? What did you see in those sessions? If you've got a thing you want to comment, just type it into the chat window in Zoom. Cool, I'll give you 10 more seconds to type in some things there. Peter, what are you seeing in this? What do you find interesting? Uh, I see a fun surprise to life. P permission, permission to act silly. I find that's really interesting. Yeah. That you're now allowed to act silly. Uh, undivided attention, which is also interesting. Um, people had fun. Smiling had fun. Um, well, um, started memorizing faces and names. Energizing, laughed. Uh, my family is laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool now it's funny Wait, this laughter different. thing um why do we laugh there are lots of reasons that we laugh one of the fundamental reasons we laugh is to relieve tension yeah um if you watch uh, a movie any movie uh in the cinema after a very very violent scene or very very tense scene in a movie there's usually a pretty cheap joke yeah it's not a very good joke but everyone in the cinema laughs because the tension of that violent scene has been released, yeah? Um, and some directors use that to make you complicit in the violence, which is quite, quite clever. Uh, but there is a degree of embarrassment in this, yeah? It's a bit embarrassing to be doing this, if fresh, especially in front of a screen with your family watching. Uh, we lost one participant. I don't know if it was too much for that person, they dropped out, or if it was a technical problem. That can happen. So people might say, this is not for me. Um, and, and that's okay, but we have to deal with that. We have to manage that within the group as well, of course. Um, also, technical things can be a problem. Ellen got a phone call. Yeah, so in the middle of that, you know, mm. what happened? If, is a game work? Can I drop out or not? I have to have to come back in again. What are the expectations around all this? Yeah. So the first question was, what happened? Okay. My second question to go into the chat is, what remind? What does this remind you of? What are things that you do which feel a little bit like this? What does this remind you of? Or does this fit in any, in any theories, do you know, or any, any models that you're interested in? Give you about 10 more seconds on that one as well. Children keep coming up. Kid, children's yeah. games, childhood games. Yeah. Okay. And you can put in the last few. Yeah. Peter, what are you seeing? A lot of connection about meeting, connecting, starting groups, dynamics and discussions. I find that's very interesting, especially. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. a lot about childhood being a kid, warming up for something. Uh, and kinesthetic exercises from my workshops or from, yeah, workshops in general. Hans said an interesting thing, entering a new playground, not knowing the rules beforehand. We had a very, very brief Just now, yeah. demo game and then went for it, you know? Um, and you kind of worked out, I'm sure, some, some rules for yourselves or some habits. You might have seen some patterns which emerged and then you played with the patterns and then you turned them around again. I'm curious what Martina, Martina Koshik, um, you said dynamics in discussions. Do you want to tell us what you were talking about there? Feel free to go off mute. And... Yeah, I did. Um, hello. Um... Hi. Hello. Yeah, it was just, it, it reminds me like a ping pong game, you know, some, somebody um, has, a, has a meaning or uh, just um, uh, <clears throat> want to, to share some thoughts or, yeah, and then another people react and maybe he or she is not, does not agree with, mm -hmm. with, with my opinions and then we have... Um, Maybe we just throw some words um, against each other, 
and then mm. maybe some other people try to do this the same and then yeah that's what i was yeah, very my nice thinking. very nice yeah it reminds me that we had a session in my game i was playing with scott and hans and uh, i can't see everybody right now but a wonderful bunch of guys bernhardt and wolfgang i think it was and we were um we got into like a ping pong between two of us, you know, for a while. I think it was me and Hans, or Hans, Adam, Hans, Adam, Hans, Adam, whatever it was, yeah? And, and we really enjoyed it. But I think the other three are going like, come on, come on, we want to play as well, yeah? And that can be a lot like in a meeting as well, where, you know, where someone dominates the meeting and they're probably feeling that they're really contributing and they're doing something very valuable. And the rest of the session can be like, oh, come on, guys, there's more than one person here. So the turn taping aspects of this are quite interesting. How this kind of, how this kind of, mindset will tend to in increase inclusion because it feels like you're leaving people out if you don't incorporate them in the game. So that was my second question. What does it remind you? I've got a third question for this debriefing round. And the third question is, where could you use this? Or where could you use things like this? If you're using it somewhere already, where else could you use something like this? Let's just try and get concrete on that. Could you please re repeat the question? Where could you use this or something like it? And if you're already using things like this, what's a new place you could use this? Thanks for the question. Nice. Ten more seconds of that. Peter, what are you seeing? I see a lot of uh, to also talk about Zoom fatigue. It's really good for breaking up, uh, making more playful uh, and social isolation, icebreakers, especially techniques for facilitation, uh, remembering names even. Mm. Um, or taking a break during longer sessions. Mm. Um, in my next leaders meeting tomorrow, Xavier says. That's cool. <laughs> That's, That's cool. Um, yeah. Getting quiet people involved. That's really interesting. Yeah, the more introverts, will they be involved in this, like in the short turn taking instead yeah. of one person talking all the time? How is it? Will, will that invite people in? One of the nice things about doing this virtually is that you don't have to make such a big, loud contribution in order to play along. You know, in a room, it tends to get quite, you know, big people really throwing things and acting it out and so on. But in this, you can kind of go, mm, and that works just fine. So people who are um, less extroverted might find it's easier to play actually online than off. Yeah. Um, really good point though from Richard uh, who points out it's difficult some people might not be taken seriously might not feel taken seriously I'm going to come back to this one later on because um, there is a really really important tension or potential tension between play and seriousness and I personally don't find play uh, the opposite of serious um, because you can play very seriously if you've ever watched a professional football game you'll see very serious play um, but uh, we'll come back to that one later on. You know, when is playfulness appropriate? When is it not appropriate? We have friends who do this kind of thing in rape camps, you know, uh, in refugee contexts, in prisons, in very, very tough situations, uh, in therapy and so on. And it's often a, a case of tone of voice um, and the framing of what works and what doesn't. But that's a really good point, Richard, and we're going to hope we come back to that one again. Mm. Okay, so next step, Peter. Where, where do you play? Yeah, and why do we play? Should we go to that next session? Let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, we're both working I from a Miro board that we put our session together on. So if you're just looking to one side, we're not watching yeah, YouTube that's why. Uh, or no. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed also somebody said uh, in a, in a stand up when you do Scrum team stand up, it can be used mm. there. I just need to put that in. I use that myself for it to make people alert. It's all giving an alertness and you're just waiting for your turn, but it can be any time. Yeah. So where do you play normally? Where do we play? That's the question. Yeah. Um, so I, sorry, you. yeah. Oh, no. is it a, the playfulness is that towards the seriousness is that you can't play in a serious context or can you make serious plays that you can actually play out in a more serious context to make the serious context work is play just for kids um is play sports is it only for leisure where do you play so we'd like to open that one up for you again as well yeah where do we play is a question in the screen um what do you th what things do you do that you consider to be play stadium field yeah whole sport thing play 14 great event in a philosophical conversation. Ooh. Some who are don't doing it regularly. 
when teasing Pierre, that's highly advisable. Mm -hmm. With my friend's kids. Well, quite a lot of range here. Got stuff which is very classic, you know, play yeah. with children, play on the sporting field, um, stuff which is kind of that quite common situation around workshops and uh, um, sort of group work and so on, where these things often, as I don't like the word, but icebreakers uh, come into that context. But there's also some, um, some stuff here which is more surprising to me as well, in a, in a philosophical conversation. Yeah. Uh, Anna Kira, what's that about? Uh, I don't know. The first association for me was playing with ideas and mm -hmm. um, a philosophical conversation when, where there is no right answer, so to say. Uh, it can become playing with the ideas, I don't know, being playful. It was just an association for yeah, me. Yeah, really nice. Really nice. So, so you're playing about something possibly quite serious there. Yeah? Mm. And the play is the mm. way you handle that content rather than the content itself. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, teasing Pierre is a nice new thing. Yeah. I noticed one. Uh, the uh, it's Richard. Is that uh, you have to you have to play at work to keep secure? I find that very interesting, since um, like facilitating workshops, etc., like that. Also, I mean, there is a certain kind of um, daring to do that to play. Would you say to keep secure? Uh, could you elaborate on that? I'd like to hear more, uh, Richard. Uh, in a surrounding where not everyone can be very open on what he or, sh or she is doing, then you have to kind of, yeah, you can't, well, you have to make sure that you're not too open yourself either. You can't. Otherwise, you're getting into difficulties. At mm. least that's my mm. view. Mm. 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 So the playfulness around that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is very, very interesting. And if we have time, we might uh, do a little exercise later around this, um, around how playfulness is often seen to be um, a loss of control and how relaxing control can be scary in certain situations, yeah, uh, because you feel vulnerable or exposed and so on. Uh, and what that, how that interplays with the culture of the group, you know, whether they can play or not and how they play. Yeah, there's some very interesting stuff around that. Yeah. So yeah, we actually talk about a freedom against control, but um, that's quite interesting because play is partly free, but partly not. Yeah, we, we, on a football field, for example, there are white lines around the edge. You don't go outside those lines and you don't pick up the ball. Yeah? And the freedom within structure is what makes that game. The only folks you can't play with is the police. I'd like to tell you a little brief story um, about one of our colleagues uh, before we move on to our next section, um, which is a guy um, in Amsterdam, uh, and his name is Marijn Fissers, and he is an amazing guy, um, very, very empathic guy, uh, who does applied improvisation and play in very extreme contexts. He's the guy who goes into rape camps and plays with people there, refugee camps, uh, hardcore prisons, dangerous youth, stuff like this. Uh, he's a guy who is very openly gay and quite camp, we would say, in so quite colorful, quite flamboyant, yeah? And he goes into real hardcore prisons and he is himself. And he's not a very big or strong person, but he's a strong character. And one of the great things I think that, that uh, Marain does is a project he does with with police and young people so around the age kind of 12, 13, 14. Um, and these are young people where social services or someone has said, this young person is in danger of entering a lifetime of crime. Yeah. They've done a few little things. They're on a typical path. We can see this, this going on. Yeah. And so what Marain does is he gets four of these kids and he gets four cops, yeah, these are Dutch cops in Amsterdam, and they go out into a, into a neighborhood somewhere, and they go behind a curtain, and they switch clothes. So the cops put on the kids, you know, street clothes, wrapper clothes, hats down over their eyes, stuff like this. The kids get to put on the police uniforms, not the guns, yeah, but the police uniforms. And then they just interact with each other 
as you know the kids playing the cops and the cops playing the kids uh, for about 20 minutes and it's it's hilarious i mean you're crying with laughter you know the, the the cops are being like hey you you know fuck you get out of my get out of my street you know and the kids are, and the kids are being like show me your papers show me your papers and you should get your hair cut you know and stuff like this and they're parodying each other um and that's it 20 minutes of that stop twist your clothes back and there's no debrief nothing but i think quite an important thing has happened there because to laugh with somebody, you have to accept that somebody as a, as a human. You can, you can laugh at somebody without respecting them in any way. But even if I disagree very strongly with someone, if I can laugh with them, we have something in common. And the result of this is that, you know, four years later, when that cop passes that kid on the street, the kid is not like turning away and, you know, hiding what they're doing. They're probably going, hey! or even like this, you know, but it's, it's a, it's a, a contact between humans and not a contact between roles anymore okay mm. let's um let's go into a little bit of a discourse around what we mean when we see when we see play when we say play yeah um we've talked already very quickly about two aspects that we see in this yeah and one of the two meanings of play now, you talked about where you, what situations you play in. And I would like to ask you now to put one last question in the chat, one last answer in the chat. How do you feel when you play? Give you 10 more seconds of that. First awkward and relieved, like that one. Part of something. Social. Part of something. Engaged. Social. Frust frustrated in a good way. That's interesting. Human. Mm. Relaxed, open-minded, excited, energized, young. That's really interesting. Yeah? A lot of the characteristics that we criticize in children are the characteristics we try and recruit in our organizations all the time. Uh, okay. Daring. That's really, really good. So in, our, in the context that Peter and I work in, what we're often trying to do is support these kind of, let's say, mindsets. Yeah. When are situations when we need to be energized? It's perhaps the most famous use of play in most of the workshops is the, the classic energizer, icebreaker, warm up. Yeah, I think play can do much more than that, but that's how we are often introduced to it because we say we need some energy in the room. And it works, it really works. You know, a, a two minute throw around game uh, in a Zoom meeting will get people's attention back. You can even measure that um, in their body electricity and chemistry and vasodilation and things like that. There's also that focused thing, yeah? So helping people to focus, I think, is an aspect of the energy, but it's more than that because sometimes it can be very valuable to distract people from something else and help them think about this thing yeah, that we're working on next. For example, in ideation, we know that one of the best things you can do to get a better quality of ideas in ideation sessions uh, is to not think about the question for a period beforehand. And the best way to not think about the question is to play a very engaging game. So there are actually measurements around that of how we can play a game to make ideation more effective beforehand. Notice a light, airy, and safe. Um, yeah. that's, that, I really like that because often I step into rooms like this uh, behind me and I, and I have to make people feel light, airy, and safe. And when that happens, it's amazing by, by actually using play they can become light area and safe even in spaces like this. So it transforms the space, even though it's a very squared space, which is not made for that, you would say. So thank you and for that. That takes into all <laughs> kinds of places which are um, where it's useful to have that feeling of safety. When you, for example, you want to say something which is risky or make a proposal or say, you know, the most dangerous thing you can say in an organization, that's not a good idea. Yeah. That's very, very difficult to say things like that. But in a playful context, these things become much, much easier to do. So very, very briefly, we divide our work into two uses of the word play. Yeah? We have the word play in the sense of games, like we've been doing so far. And we have the word play in the sense of a theatrical play, yeah? where you play through something. And... 
there we come now to a little bit to our sort of uh, pl serious play, TM Lego, I know that, yeah, but the idea of playing seriously um, is a very interesting one because has anybody here ever seen a play by Ibsen? Anyone ever seen it? Yeah, yeah. It's heavy, yeah? I mean, it's, also, you know, it's really, really hard work. It is not fun, but it's still a play. Yeah, they are players on the stage. And as actors, you know, Peter and I, when we leave the house, we might say to our partners, I'll see you later, I'm playing tonight. It's still hard work, and we take it seriously. There is, um, there is an author called Jane McGonagall, who you might have read, uh, who wrote a book called Society is Broken, yeah? um, about play and how, we, how play can be very energizing and focusing. Yeah? And she points out, in her opinion, that it's wrong to make play the opposite of work, yeah? because that's just not true. Yeah? Um, when we play, we are more productive, we are more imaginative, we're less likely to hurt ourselves, we're more open to trying new things. These are fantastic precursors to work. Yeah? That's the ideal working mindset, you might say. When are we non-productive, non-imaginative, constantly hurting ourselves and unable to imagine doing new things? That's depression. So the opposite of play is actually depression. Yeah. Uh, so play and work are actually, I think you can overlap really, really well when it's appropriate, if you can frame it right. So we're going to talk today about games and we're going to talk about theater and theatrical tools. Peter, you're more theatrical than me, as I can see from your background. So do you want to tell us a little bit about the main tools that you're using in theater? Or theater, theater, that is, yeah. Well, um, in theater, of course, you would have to rehearse. You would often have a script you would need to go through, and there's a lot of serious preparation for that. Um, and also to get actors into the right character, working deeply with the character, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of reflection, a lot of work on that, and a lot of research work as well. Um, and some of it can be amazingly playful. I mean, a lot of the warm-up exercises we take out of the theater and put into organizations are, are there to make actors collaborate and play more and have more fun um, before we actually go into the serious stuff, in quotation marks. So, so that there, it's, it's about structuring that work and about building up a character, about researching often as well, and, and also go in depth in yourself and finding so where am I aligned with this character, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a lot of internal work and a lot of group work. And there's also a lot of administrational work and a lot of production uh, planning work and a lot of stuff around that. So it's not just play, but that's about producing plays. Um, yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> so when we talk about applying play in the theatrical sense, there's one or two methods that we talk about there. Um, Applied theatre is a thing, you know, you can go to conferences for applied theatre um, and it's not just in the sense of using a theatrical performance to do something, but in the sense of taking methodologies and concepts from within theatre. There's a giant rabbit behind Peter and it's <laughs> amazing, uh, beyond Pierre, sorry. Um, and then applying those in the kind of context that we talked about in the, in the chat just now. Uh, one of those is a thing called forum theater, which we'll come back to very often, which we use quite a lot also in the development of software. It's a software development tool that you can use, a uh, full-bodied one. So I just want to, Peter, can you share the slides again? Because you've got it set up, I yes, think. Yes, I will love, would love to do that. And just really so quickly, the context in we're using these oh, two kinds of play. And click one forward. Language. There we go. So if you like, the things that we are talking about, we divide into three main areas of application. And these three absolutely overlap. They overlap almost all the time. It's really hard to separate them. Yeah. So we tend to be using play in both its senses in supporting collaboration. Anytime you've got people working together, team coaching, helping people have very difficult conversations, making interventions into a group when the culture is broken or could be better, mm. uh, helping leadership to communicate better. These are things that we use play for. Also simply handling stress, uh, burnout, all that kind of stuff. Hey, it was a nice squiggle. Who did that? I don't know, but it's amazing. Somebody went into our... <laughs> Annotate. 
Well, yeah. It's playful. It is playful. Um, <laughs> co-creation. Yeah. Uh, this is my background. I'm working in design. So we're usually trying to create a new service, a new, a new product, uh, a new experience for people. Um, whether the dev team or a design team or a larger team in the organization and all those things around that work research into needs ideation idea selection sense making of the data that you've got uh, prototyping things trying things out and implementation are places that we use both types of play and then in co-learning so in the training part of that and this overlaps very much with the previous two uh, when a personal group of people is to learn something new, play can be used to support that in a very valuable and often quite efficient way. So those are the things we're going to be talking about today. But I want to find out more about you guys. Yeah, I'm going to teach you a game which you can use to inquire a little bit into each other. So Peter, if you can stop sharing for a moment. Thank you. I just did. Uh, yes. Do you want to teach us the game which is called Color Advance Emotion? And we can play Color it with a small... Color Advance Emotion, yes. Yeah. Uh, color Advanced Emotion uh, is a game that's for storytelling, basically, to, to make somebody tell a story easier. I use it a lot for training people uh, and to make them observe what kind of layer they use of their imagination when they talk, tell a story. So color is when you somebody's telling a story and you have a coach helping you, somebody should be a coach, and then color is about the details. You have to color the details. So it's like, uh, I was at the lake, color. Well, you know, the lake, which had these amazing stones and, and a cliff formations around it. Okay, advance is the next level. Advance, I want to hear more. And then I went towards the beautiful stone formations. Okay, and then the next level could be emotion. What did that do to you? What emotion do you get? And then standing there by these amazing stone formations, it actually reminded me of being a kid when my dad took me uh, out fishing. And we always, always fished from this rocky area where these stone formations were. Okay, advance, advance. Too much emotion maybe for somebody, but advance. Yeah, so we went out actually now in a boat. Okay, we want color, more detail. The boat was a motorboat. That's, you know, one of those, it was green and had one of these engines you could pull in, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, color, advance, and then emotions you could put on as well. So I'd like as to play this. Thanks, Peter. I'd like to play this in a small group, yeah? So uh, we need, oh, let's say four people, yeah? Three people tonight, three people. Any volunteers? If you're a volunteer, type your name in the, uh, in the chat window. We could change that if you don't <laughs> want to play, but this works fine. So Scott and Akira. One more, maybe. It's a very harmless game. Yeah, don't worry. Come on. Okay. They always say it's harmless until someone loses an eye. There we go. Okay, so, so, uh, so let's take Scott and Akira and Elsa with the first three. Okay, Scott and Akira and Elsa. Um, would everybody else switch your camera off, please? Everyone else just switches their camera off for a moment. Then we should see Scott and Akira and Elsa on the screen. Yeah. Okay, and Peter and myself are still there as well. Okay, so um, what's going to happen is that one of you is going to tell a story. Put your hand up if you want to tell a story. <clears throat> Elsa, you made a noise. You're telling a story. Okay, there are many ways to volunteer. There are many ways to volunteer. Yeah, but don't worry, you'll have help telling this story. Okay, because Scott is going to be supporting you. Yeah, and Scott will support you with three different types of hand movements. Yeah. Uh, this is either the color. That means I need to know more detail, not only details about color, but any kind of more detail. Yeah. Color, yeah, like the rippling waves of color on the, on the, on the evening lake. Yeah. Then there is advance. Okay, take the story forward. More action. I wanna know more. Okay, and the third one is a hand on the heart. Yeah, I have to put it up fairly high, Scott, because your name tag is there. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, um, which means I want to know about the emotion at this point. Okay, now Elsa, to totally take the pressure off you, you have a tag team partner, which is Anna Kira. So anytime if you get totally stuck, you can just say tag, yeah, and Anna Kira will take over. She can also tag back, by the way, when she gets stuck. And Scott is always assisting both of you telling us. 
I'd okay. like the rest of you, Excellent. I'd like the rest of you to really look closely at what's going on. Yeah. Um, if you want to switch to speak of you, you'll be able to concentrate on Elsa. That might be slightly embarrassing for her, but she'll manage. She's a smart lady. Uh, and really see what you see going on in her face, or you could flip, flip between Scott and Elsa and Anakira as you like. So to help these guys out, let's give them something, some, some material to, to think about. Could someone in the list, please type in the list, please type, uh, a profession, a profession. A teacher, okay? Maybe there's a teacher in this story. And could someone else in the list please type in an, a non-related emotion, angry. So maybe there's a teacher in this story and maybe there's anger, okay? Uh, so Elsa will start telling a story. And Scott, if you want it to advance, you do this. If you want more emotion, you do this. If you want more color, you do this. Elsa, if you get stuck, tag, and Anna Kira is ready to take over. And let's count them in with a three, two, one, go. Okay. Um, my father's a teacher and um, he likes to play Angry Birds with his class. And um, what does that mean again? Oh, more, more detail. Details. More detail. Okay. So he put up a huge screen and he gave a controller uh, or like an interface to all, all his pupils and made them play Angry Birds. And um, as he do, uh, they're getting really excited doing that because they like to smash the, you know, like the castles and the more they smash, the more excited they really get. And um, one time something really not so nice happened, which made my father really angry as well like he was turning into an angry bird himself actually huh? so um they made fun of him in a way that he didn't like hmm. uh what do i say when i when i'm stuck a tag <laughs> or just shout out anna, shout out anna. anna yeah. so <laughs> the thing that the the, the his students did was they actually try to play Angry Birds in the class. So they would build up with boxes and get actual pigs that then they would throw uh, at the box. And obviously um, the, the teacher was really hurt because there were animals involved that got hurt. It wasn't <laughs> like in the game, you know, but they were throwing the boxes. So he realized that this, all this um, stuff that was interesting at the beginning got really frustrating at the end. So. The animal uh, safety uh, service came in and they closed down the school for a couple of months because of that. Uh, and we're going to stop the story <laughs> there. If you switch on your video cameras again, go ahead and switch on and we can give our three colleagues a round of silent Zoom applause, which looks like this. Hey. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. So again, not going to debrief. We're going to send you guys out into rooms to try this. Yeah, the rooms of three or four people. Yeah, um, maybe we. Yeah, Pierre can decide how that, how that breaks Sorry. out. Yeah, and we're going to give you a theme to talk about. Okay, we would like you to in this room of three or four decide first of all who'll be the first person to tell a to, to speak to be the speaker. And which one other person will be able to do these three movements yeah, to help them with this? Okay. And either person can hand off to somebody else at any time in the group. Yeah. Be relaxed about that. Yeah. Um, but what we'd like you to do is talk about the challenges <clears throat> that you are facing where you think play could be useful. What are the challenges you are facing? Where the play could be, where play could be useful. So one person can start telling their challenge, or somebody else can ask them for more detail, emotion, or move on, move on. Yeah, and we'll do that for about four or five minutes. So you might have time to have one or two people start their own stories. And again, if you get stuck, you can always hand over to a new story with somebody else, or if you want, you can pick up the same story and keep telling it in your from your point of view. Peter, anything to add to that one? No, oh, it's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Just okay. Quick choose, quickly choose someone. Yeah. 
to start but off. But he chooses someone to start. That person talks and choose one person to be their assistant who's doing the movements and you can switch out at any time. The rest mm. of you, please observe closely what's going on and see what you notice. I'll debrief you when you come back. Pierre, okay. can we send the warp ships out? A three. I think, one, I think four, four is, okay, okay. Groups one, of three or four, yeah. Two, three. See you later. <laughs> Fantastic. So our clock was at zero, but we didn't get pulled out of the meeting. Oh. And let's pull them out if we can. <clears throat> okay, bye-bye, Tanya. We'll see you around. Yeah. Bye, Tanya. Okay. So there was some blind games. So yeah, very good. Let's, uh, let's do this one by, by, by a show of hands. If you want to say something, either call out or show your hands. Um, what surprised you about that? Go what on. surprised you about that game? What did you notice? Anybody. Anybody can just say something. Usually, Fred. Fred. we had to Corrado. Uh, oh, get, yeah. Uh, he did a fantastic job, and uh, I didn't even want to interrupt you with doing all these these signs uh, because he was in, in such a flow. Yeah, and, and but he did switch very rapidly between emotions and advancing and so forth. Uh, but then after right. two or three minutes, I, I said, you know, stop. This is this is so good. <laughs> uh, I don't want to interrupt you anymore. You know, keep going. Well, this is really really good. Um, it, it, we play lots of games with a similar idea where you're basically you're, you're, you're giving somebody feedback basically as you go along um, and you um, sometimes that can feel like interrupting you know people who were telling the stories uh, was it ever useful for you to get a hand signal did you ever find it helpful or was it always um, a disturbance I sometimes got signals from Sartak that were exactly pointing in the direction I was going anyway. Okay. I was thinking about the next thing and he, he said, you know, emotional, whatever. Uh, yeah. Oh, that was actually what I was going to say. That's interesting. That's interesting. Anybody else? What was it like being the person telling the story and getting this kind of uh, feedback? So Hans says it was helpful. Go ahead and shout it out if you want to. We can use the chat or we can use voices. We're not such a big group. I am. I find it interesting that somehow that feedback keeps you more engaged because a lot of the time if you're telling something, you have this feeling that you don't know how that is landing in the audience. But having that little bit of feedback get, gives you a hint of, you know, this is not getting interesting, so let's move ahead or, or tell me a little bit more about it. So I, I found it, you know, it's, it's good um, on both ends of mm. the activity. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I often use it, Fred, for it's also you start to notice that you have a preference sometimes for, for something like people sometimes tend to have a preference for maybe color things too much or too little or whatever, or talk too much about actions, forget about all the details and the colors and stuff, or completely ignore emotions. And by, by using this exercise, you get a little bit of it, the whole thing, and especially what the audience needs at that moment, you could say. Yeah, that's true. I, I found it difficult um, because I was so interested in being coordinated with my with my uh, coach. <laughs> so I was so busy trying to understand what he was telling me, and then he suddenly said to me, "Have you stopped? Or I'd like you to go on." I said, "Oh, thank you. I'll just go on." <laughs> it's very, <laughs> very interesting, you know. I mean, it's very <laughs> difficult. If I hadn't been so worried about co synchronizing with him, maybe it'd have been easier. But you know, someone's doing this and this at you, and you go. <laughs> voilà. So what we have here, I think, is it's changed. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, I just have Go on. A, a last mm -hmm. question: How did it feel to have somebody else to to be able to to, to keep your back to say, uh, tech? How was that? And hearts nodding. It, yeah, because right. that was, was exactly what I wanted to to point out. It it takes away the sense of ownership. You know, it's not mm -hmm. my story. So it's also if they want a lot of details, I I, I think it's not so important. But it, I I don't care anymore because it's not. It's not mine. So if I find it too detailed, I don't feel bad about it. I give them what they want. So distributing of the re responsibility. Anyway. Yeah. 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 So what we have here, I think, in this particular game, and it's a game, yeah, um, is a, a very fast and fairly non-invasive feedback loop. Yeah. Um, because you may have found if you were really in the flow of something, you may have waited a little bit after getting the signal to finish your sentence and then you went into, into uh, what they asked for, even longer than that. And this is, I think, 
quite interesting. The things we said here were very playful about not feeling it was too important and um, feeling it was very collaborative between the two of you. Jennifer was saying, I really wanted to you know, link up with my coach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have this in conversation anyway with nodding and smiling and so on, but having that, that specificity of I want more detail, I want more um, uh, less detail or I want emotion is very, very interesting. By the way, in situations uh, where you have, what well, I've played this game in organizations, it becomes a real thing in organizations. So you will see during presentations, people going, yeah, you've said this too often. Yeah. And it can, it can be quite, you know, quite direct at times, but you'll also see a bit of this and a bit of this. Yeah. Um, during conversations, both ways during the conversation. Yeah? So it can be actually a very practical thing to introduce. It's kind of a, it becomes more of a co-coaching than yeah, just a straight yeah. coaching. Yeah, very good. It's quite a fun one to play with. Okay. Peter, I would suggest that before we go into our main chunk, have a short break yeah. for people. What do you think? Yeah, yes. perfect timing. How do you guys feel about a break? Yes. Yeah, excellent. So on my computer screen, it says 1906. Is 10 minutes enough for a quick sort of bio break and grab a coffee? Then it's only 50, 45 yeah. minutes when we come back. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see you back okay. here at, let's say, quarter past, a round number, okay. quarter past. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much so far, everybody. Feel free to switch off and mute if you like to. I suggest you leave the Zoom window open. One of the fun things you can always discuss with different people in different contexts, organizations, is what does now mean? Yeah. Oh, um, and you will find very interesting answers, you know. Yeah. Um, if you ask, you know, if, if, I, if I'm ordering bricks for a building site, now could mean yeah, today, you know. Yeah. If I'm ordering uh, food for a meal, now means in the next 10 minutes, you know. Um, if I need uh, medical attention, now means something else. And in, in a theater, now means within fractions of a second. So theater people have a very, 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 very um, anal attitude to timing. So it's now after 15, so I think we should start again. Is that okay for everybody? Can we start again? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Oh, Pierre, I feel sick with that background of yours. You're just showing off yeah, your quad, your quad core Mac. You know, you're just, <laughs> you know, because those of us who are on dual cores, so we, we just we can't do that. We can't do the. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> no, this is, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on two cores. You're on four. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so cool. Okay. I think what we're going to do now with you guys is we're going to we're going to do a little warm up game. Yeah, uh, which I think is quite an interesting one. Uh, you might know it. it's quite an old classic one. So if you know it, just play along. We're going to explain to you one of our main tools, which is again, switching away from the games and more towards the theater. Yeah, you find that interesting. And then for the remainder of the, of the hour, we're going to ask you guys to challenge us with questions, with requests for activities, and we'll just use up the remaining time, uh, either with some breakouts or with some, with some new sessions uh, around that. We'll organize ourselves on that front. Is that okay for everybody? Yeah, fantastic. Okay. So, Peter, could you share your screen again? And um, we need slide six, which is a challenge game. Yeah, slide six. Exactly. Challenges, slide six. Okay, the planning, planning game. game. Fantastic. Okay. Exactly. So, this game has many names. Uh, we're calling it the planning game today. And we're going to ask you guys to play this. Uh, in small groups, in breakouts, without supervision. <gasps> yeah. So uh, that can be fun. There can be two of you playing the game and other people watching, or you can do it in a circle within the group as you like. Yeah. And in this game, there will be two rounds. So we're going to ask you to self-organize and play the first round until we send you a message to say, please switch to the second round. Okay. Uh, so please don't switch before you get the message. So next slide, please, Peter. So this is a game where the two of you are going to plan a trip. Now we could imagine that COVID restrictions are over, yeah, and you're going to plan a trip together. And one of you, who you will designate player one, yeah, um, will make a suggestion. We could go to Mexico, for example. Yeah. Now please make a concrete suggestion. We could go to France. We could go skiing. You know, we could have a beach holiday. They're all fine, but not let's do something nice. That's not very useful. Yeah. 
And the other person will respond to that with a sentence that starts, yes, but. Okay. And they continue that sentence. Now, this response might include another suggestion. Yes, but Mexico is too far. What about Spain, for example? Yeah, that can be useful. And then the first person will respond to the response with another sentence starting, yes, but. So it's, we could, <laughs> yes, but, <laughs> yes, but, <laughs> yes, but, yes, but, yes, but, like this. Ping pong, backwards and forth between the two of you. That's the first round of the game. Yeah. The second round of the game will ask you with a signal in your chat rooms to switch is exactly the same game. And if you want to, you can even start with the same suggestion from the same person. But next slide, please. We will ask you to change the response. So we could go to Mexico. Yes. And on the way, let's stop in Spain. Yes. And ha ha. Yeah. So it's the same yeah. ping pong, ping pong, ping pong. Yeah. If you played the game before, just sit back and enjoy it and watch how your colleagues get on with it. So we're going to put you into groups now. Let's say groups of four, if possible. Yeah, so there could be one person who drops out or can't hear or whatever. And you can all play in a circle if you want to, or you can ping pong between two people. Please just play the yes, but round first. Play yes, but. And then we'll give you a signal on text. So watch out for that in your window. It's not always very obvious. Um, and you should switch to yes, but. And when you come back, we'll have three questions for you. Peter, can you stop sharing? And the person who begins is the person with the most beautiful socks. <laughs> oh shit, I have no socks. <laughs> okay, at three we start. One, three. One, two, two, three. See you. Fantastic, it's the warping back. Yeah. Everyone warping back, amazing. Okay, so. Um, Peter is still there. I can't see you. He's sitting in the dark in the, in the, in the audience, I like guess. a director. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, three questions. Yeah. And I'd like you to type your answers in the, in the chat window. Yeah. So we play, you had the same task twice. Yeah. Um, you had the, the task to plan a trip. Yeah. And we ask you to do that in two different mindsets, in a yes and mindset, in a yes but mindset. Okay. First question, which of those, yes and or yes but, do you find is most common in organizations? But, 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 but. Cool. So we're pretty unanimous on that one. Okay. And that's cool. You know, organizations do important things. Some of my clients build power stations. It's very important. They say but sometimes, you know. Um, Second question, of the two, of the two, yes and or yes but, which one was most helpful in the task of actually getting towards a plan? Which one took you further towards creating a plan for your holiday? So pretty unanimous on, on and. I've got an answer for you on the yine one in a second, actually, Pierre. It's a really nice question. So third question, the holidays that you planned using yes and, you could easily make a plan, you said, yeah? holidays you plan doing that can you afford them are they practical are they maybe uh, are they comfortable are they maybe too overloaded so what are the not a very practical not affordable okay what about the holidays you made using yes and are they are they really the kind of thing you definitely want to do so some got yes yeah, but most of us there have a too expensive impractical too overloaded and that's really interesting too. Yeah. Um, I like so hitchhiking to Berlin. Hitchhiking to Berlin. That's pretty easy. Partying with the police. Depends if you know the police or not. I know some police who really know how to party. That's what credit cards are for. Thank you, Scott. That's a healthy attitude, which we should, we should uh, certainly support. Um, so this is really a, a really fun game that we often use uh, to explain different mindsets in organizations and to make a very important point because I'm going to be a bit cruel here to lots of my colleagues. A lot of work around facilitation, and especially when it comes from applied improvisation or if it comes from play and so on, really kind of um, worships the yes and. And if people are not natural yes anders, they feel bad about it. They're made to feel bad about it in workshops. But in fact, the yes but is at least as important as the yes and. And it's really, really important to acknowledge that. Yeah. 
because there are people in the room who are natural yes butters and that's good we need them we need them they stop us building power stations that kill people yeah they stop us polluting the environment they stop us wasting money going off brand doing stuff we can't do anyway we also need yes and we need both of these and in my work in design we divide our world into divergent and convergent phases diverging yes and yes and yes and for example when generating ideas or collecting data yeah and yes but yes but when we are choosing ideas selecting them or focusing down on the important data and things like this and just saying that to an or to people in the organization saying look if you're a natural yes ander that's great if you're a natural yes butter that's great but we're going to take turns yeah playing this game is a really really good way to make that point with people that you value both sides of it and that we need both sides of it pierre you asked about yain yeah which is a german word meaning yes and no and there is an in, there's a similar game um to this one which is a kind of a yain game yeah it's in between so the way that works is that someone makes a suggestion for example let's go to mexico and the next person says what i like about your idea is and they choose one thing out of that that they like yeah is that mexico is really warm and sunny yeah what about another sunny place that's really close to home yeah what i like about your idea is not traveling so far would be good on the environment but perhaps we could find a less environmentally uh, unfriendly way to travel and still go somewhere exotic and you can still get a middle way which can be satisfying for both yeah. so that's the yine version of this peter there's there's also the constructive but in the sense that you the but is not a contradiction but it's a question mm -hmm. so you that's say more. yes but uh, how are we going to get there yes but uh, how can we afford that mm. yes but uh, so what about safety so you ask about you still accept the pr mm. the premise but you want more info you more more intel and then you can use it constructively instead of saying yes but i, I don't want to do that mm. nice that's a complete block <laughs> so like in improv games there's a different ways of using bot thank you this is a game that i do at the start of every presentation i give even if it's a 800 people in the room yeah they're all playing it with their neighbors before we before we go on uh just to get that idea of there are differences in the room and that they're all valuable yeah because when you talk about play to people about being creative i never use that word by the way but around creating things and so on people expect this kind of this this worship of the of the spontaneous and the and the wild and the and the crazy stuff and that's not what we need we need to balance these things we're going to go into a section now for about 10 minutes just to sort of talk to you about one of our key tools yeah and the name of this tool and it has various names um uh, but most of them have the word theater in them and as you're the more theatrical of us peter i'm going to let you start about this tool that we use so much the tool yes the tool is forum theater which is a tool uh which is used to create a forum basically um so instead of the it's one way theater it's two ways theater so it's interactive theater where the audience can comment on what's going on on stage and they can e even step on stage and try out new things it was you could say it's originally created for oppression and oppressor but here we can work with it as a as a tool for developing new ideas and co-creating about ideas rehearsing and testing uh technical abilities as well so you play out something and you get new ideas from the audience to try out new things again that's that's a basically the frame very shortly told so what does that look like can you paint a picture what well, this might this might take place in its typical use yeah in its typical use originally you would say there is somebody i worked a lot with this in africa for instance there's somebody who is an oppressor and somebody who's oppressed right in some way um and then the audience cannot take the king's position you could say they can take the op op oppressed position and they can step in there and then they can work against the oppression but in the more postmodern version it's more about dilemmas everybody is in a dilemma the king is in a dilemma as well with the board or whatever if it's in an organization so it's about discussing these dilemmas and then the audience can step in and try that out try new strategies out in a fictional setting which is safe 
and say, ah, rewind, I want to go back to where you say this, or where you stand like that, where you did this. And then you could try it out again with new strategies. That's cool. Martina's posting that she uses this already, and that's super interesting. Um, cool. So again, we're running it. We're running. We might run a theatre scene, yeah. Um, and then people will say, okay, let's stop this. Let's try it again. And you can step into one role and try something else, yeah. And I've seen this done with very large groups of people, hundreds, yeah. Um, I like to do it with around about fifteen to twenty-five people, yeah. Um, with smaller groups, it gets very, very tiring because it's actually quite hard work. Yeah? But with larger groups, you can, people can hang out and so on. This is often used for developing personal strategies. Yeah? So, okay, what do I do if I'm being bullied? Well, you could try this, you could try this. Let me, let me try, let me try, let me try. But this might surprise you, um, is that we often use this in software development. And I don't mean to develop the team, I mean to actually develop the software. Because what is faster than wireframes? Theater. Yeah? Theater is the fastest way in the world of making something happen. If humans can conceive it, you can make it happen using theater. So let's, let's just go into that for a second. Yeah? Um, we haven't got time to do this as a group today, but I'm happy to talk to you about it later if you want to. Uh, let's have Peter and myself playing. So everyone else, please switch off your cameras yes. for a second. The camera's off for a moment. And we'll just have... And I'm in a very different background. His, are I'm you showing off your, your four, four core again? Oh. oh, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say I'm in a cafe. And I just want to call you. Okay. Yeah. So um, I shall be then, doesn't really matter, but I will be in my bedroom. There we go. Uh, so... In this situation, we're going to pretend uh, that Peter is a user and I'm a piece of software that doesn't exist yet. Yeah? So let's say that we think Uber isn't good enough, yeah? that there could be something better done there. And we are going to use, we could use Forum Theatre here, we'll start it off, um, to play around with what possibilities are and how they feel. So let's just try. Peter will be the, will be the user and I will be the software. So let me give myself actually a more suitable uh, software background, I think maybe uh, this one. There we go. Excellent. So, Peter. Yeah, I just had this meeting in a cafe and I'm now, I'm going to leave, so I'm going to order an Uber. Yeah. Hi, Peter. I'm your Uber. I see you finished Hi. your meeting. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing back to the hotel yeah. now. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm kind yeah. of tired. Well, you said yeah, uh, uh. you said you weren't, you weren't really sure about that. Uh, so, I mean, are you going back to the hotel because you have got no other options? I mean, do you feel like doing something this evening? Uh, yeah, it was kind of a boring meeting. So, yeah, something different okay. would be nice to do. Okay, well, when you were in Portland last time, um, you went to that great art gallery and you get a really good rating on, on Yelp, the exhibition there. Yeah. So That's I've true. noticed That's that true. there's an exhibition uh, in a similar type in an art gallery quite close to your hotel. And it actually finishes at 730. So you could do an hour of it and get and get uh, still an early night. How does that sound? That's a great idea i didn't think of that um of course yeah yeah, yeah. i'd love How to does do that, that sound cool yeah would you like me to link you to some other business travelers or go to the same exhibition uh sure i know no one here so yeah you didn't really great. seem convinced uh, uh well I'm, I'm a little bit shy you know so okay okay so let's <clears> let's <throat> not do that let's not do that yeah and let's just stop it there so please put your videos on again guys switch on the cameras i'll go to a less disgusting background. So I'd ask you guys, let's do this a real quick debrief in the chat window. What happened? What did you notice? So what we didn't do there was we could have had a group of people around us. Yeah. Um, who at any point could have said stop and tried something else. Yeah. Which the app could do. Yeah. Because we might've noticed that some people say, this is, this is way too intrusive for me. I don't want that. Yeah, there should be some permission levels in this. First of all, may I look at your interest to see what else you might like to do? I was kind of an all knowing um, big brother app there as well, which some people might not like others might love it. Yeah. But if we had four or five people around us, they could go stop and they could step in and be the app. And but even if we just play it once, yep. and then rewind and try something else and try something else and try something else, we can do four or five versions of an app 
literally in 10 minutes. Yeah. And there is no wireframer in the world who can do that. I've done this one quite a lot with, um, with IT people. And one of the comments that I found most interesting was from some fairly senior IT guys, a team of five very senior CIOs. And they said, this is super interesting because when we start sketching, we go down our best practice routes. You know, we know what a shopping basket looks like. We know what a, what a login stream looks like. And we follow those strange, those things. Yeah. But making this into a human human exchange actually made us think of new routes that we wouldn't normally follow in our best practice. Peter, what have you, have you used that method as well? Yes, a lot for, but mainly for social interaction. It's kind of a 4d sketching. You say there is um, the 3d sketching with models and I mean, just a walk through and it's kind cool. of a 4d sketching, 4D sketching. In sketching time you could call it as well. Um, I used it a lot for more, you know, problem solving relations, relations in organizations, especially mm. and dilemmas in organizations to, to change perspectives, nice. uh, often nice. within management and employees. So that's, that's the situation with these tools. There's always two options. You could be working on the problem or working on the team. Yeah. Are we trying to make the team better, the team more resilient, more ready, more capable, um, more resilient, or are we actually going into the problem to work on that? And you can use these tools in both ways. Yeah. Uh, Silka is asking, do you verbalize the shopping experience of the customer? How would that work with the example of an online shop? So, there are, this is a bit difficult online in lockdown, yeah? But um, you could physically simulate that, yeah? As kind of a metaphor, just, just a second, Peter. So here's an example. Yep. We did a session where we, if you, looked, if you looked at the room, it looked like a hotel check-in, yeah? There was a person there behind the desk who was playing the software. There was a person in front of the desk who had a big bag. Yeah. And it looked just like a hotel check-in, but actually we were prototyping the front end for um, a file story system like Dropbox. Yeah. So it was like, if we do this as a conversation between two people and we get it, so it feels right first. And then we think about how does it come behind glass? Peter. I, I worked what's called reflection in action, which you probably know, uh, uh, Stolderman and, and, and Lugrain. I worked with that for app design where you then talk about your experience while you are in the experience, which means like when I'm using the app with Adam being the computer, I can also say right now, I feel a little bit, I can kind of time out and say to people, I feel a little bit uneasy now because it's like big brothers watching me and the, yeah, yeah I'd like to, to try that. Uh, of course. So reflection in action could uh, display your, your actual inner thoughts, your yeah. reflections on how to use it. Absolutely. As Another well. way to do that is to, give each actor, um, even the app actually, to give them a second actor behind them, who stands behind them. And that person's job is to speak the inner monologue. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so when he says, shall I connect you to some other uh, riders, to other travelers, sorry, maybe Peter's inner monologue and says, oh, that sounds a bit invasive. No, I don't want to meet any strangers. Yeah? And, and we can be aware of that. The apps in a monologue might say, uh, interface with, uh, with Yelp, uh, check last diary, um, grab that data, that's valuable, you know, stuff like this. So it can be the evil, the evil voice of the computer as well can be interesting. Which, that's one uh, I, just to build on that, yes, and Adam, just to build on that. Yes. Uh, uh, you can then have many different voices from the team building in, skipping in. Yeah. I mean, as you say, and somebody stepping representing, in. Stepping, in. stepping in, representing that side of it, representing the other side of it. So you hear these different voices from people from the team. So they're brought in, but into the live situation. So it's not a discussion around a table. You're discussing it in the situation. You could say, absolutely. In the voices. One more question there. Um, so Martina asks, how do you document all the different ideas? You could have a scribbler just someone writing this stuff all down. Um, Actually, often it's too fast to document, you know, and you say, okay, we accept that and we just keep moving. Yeah. And the stuff which is good will come back and the stuff which is not good will not come back, you know, so it's not quite so, or quite so structured, but that's how you work in theater. You say, no, try something else, try something else. And the one you're left with is the one that's there at the end. Okay. So that's one to try. I said, we're doing it for software there as well. And we do that for all kinds of situations. 
uh, let's say consultant situation where I'm talking to my bank advisor, we can play that as a scene, a retail situation, educational situation, a course, a stand up. We can do all these things as a scene and step in and take over and try something different. Yeah. And we use that as a research tool. So we get real stories from people and play around with them. Certainly as an ideation tool, but it's also a prototyping tool because you're kind of, kind of testing it while you're doing it. Have an idea, test it straight away. Assumption-based testing, testing, but it's not too bad. And it's an implementation tool as well. When you have your new process, your new stand-up, whatever it is, you can actually use this to learn how to do it as you go along. Mm. Peter, I think we should open the floor up a little bit. We've got 15 minutes left. So I think we need yep. five minutes to round up. Yeah. Um, I invite you all to switch your microphones on because there's, there's only a, a one screen full of us left now. We've uh, scared away the rest. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, plus a few people who have still got their cameras off now, yeah, which is fine. Um, so what we have now is about 10 seconds to go in, uh, 10 seconds, <laughs> 10 minutes <laughs> to go into <laughs> stuff that, it, that interests you right now. Yeah. Um, we can either break out into breakout rooms. Um, we can do it in forum like this in plenary. Uh, so I'd like to ask you to reflect for just a moment. Yeah. The name of the last technique, Radovan, is forum theatre forum theater and there are other names for the same technique as well i can we often call it investigative rehearsal uh and if you i can send you a link to a really detailed instruction on how to do that one yeah if you remind me afterwards yeah so if you have a burning question right now yeah we're going to invite you to put it into the uh put it into the chat window what would you like to spend a few minutes now working on Peter, can you share the uh, the slide deck again? Um, with not on present, yes. but on slide ten. So I'm just typing into this some sort of some points. Bystanders. That was interesting. Yeah. What are they used for? Nope. Or what can they be used for? Okay. So I think uh, we've got the big points there. Yeah. Um, and let's just try and go through these really quickly as like a Q and A. And you're welcome anyone to put in any time your your uh, your questions verbally. Just shout out. We're a small enough group now. That's fine. So can you unshare again, Peter? We're oh, going to yeah. skip question one because we're going to come to that at the end and give you guys some directions to go into where you can learn more. Yeah. Um, and Pierre has also just answered question one B. There's a Trello link there with games and tools, yeah? And some of the communities that we want to introduce you guys oh, to right. have really developed collections of this. Um, someone asked about switching it to virtual, ah. yeah? And this is, of course, a thing that many people are doing right now. Mm -hmm. One of the communities that we work in has got a head start on that. They've been really pushing virtual play and virtual improvisation, virtual creativity for a couple of years already. So it's not just a typical COVID reaction. There's actually been some, some considered work around this going on from that group. We'll come to them in a second. Peter, bystanders. What are your thoughts on bystanders? Uh, for forum. Yeah. Uh, they are essential, of, this. of course. Yeah. The well, bystanders are, are essential because it's the, it's, it's the, this, it's the, um, debate amongst the bystanders that you actually want and the play itself is just a, a catalyst of, for creating that forum for debate amongst the bystanders you could say mm -hmm. to to tw to twist the image or the practices or whatever that you already have as you say you go into a, a well we, we work like this and that's how we normally do it by doing it with theater you can often twist i mean surprise be surprised to surprise yourself um, especially if you get, I mean, external people in different ways, but also doing it yourself for sure. Mm. So I think it depends. Charles, on I was way. asking that question. What about in, in not just in the foreign theater, but also elsewhere, where the bystanders uh, can can move into this um, play or into this idea and become part of a movement? Yeah, this. I so think that the idea catches on. Mm -hmm. Can you use it for that as well? I think so. I mean, there is there is a balance here between activities, whether they're playful activities or not, where you consciously involve lots of people. Yeah. So one of 
Um, a client I know used a very large prototyping exercise where they involve 3,000 of their staff in running prototypes or something. Yeah. And when that project finally launches, it's a huge difference when 3,000 people say, I was involved in this project. Yeah. Or ready for buy in. Yeah. Um, but it also depends on, in your actual session what you mean by bystanders. It's fine to have someone uh, who is less engaged. Yeah. But what I don't do in any, in any theatrical methods is I do not allow anyone to only watch. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they are fine to hang back and be, be the least engaged person. That's cool. Yeah. But nobody says I'm just here to watch. Mm-hmm. Usually that means top bosses, HR, PR, stuff like that. Yeah. That's uh, I'm sorry. We don't do that. Yeah. And uh, I'm lucky enough okay. to be able to do that to people because it really yeah. inhibits people. Peter. It's, uh, I work a lot with middle management often, and what I normally do is I build up the group, for instance, for, to work with uh, situational leadership to, uh, and build with cases. They then play out these cases as forum. And, and once, uh, not only once, but several times, I then experienced then a couple of guys from top management comes waltzing in and say, oh, don't worry about us. We'll just sit here and watch. And then as a facilitator, I have to say, time out, we'll just have a break and we'll just clarify this and then talk to them about you can't just watch because it's going to be something completely different now. So they need to be invited in and in, engage in actually being part of it if, if they're there in the room. And if not, there, and then all, often what they do is they leave and they <laughs> let the middle management guys work. But, but it's very important. So you don't have like, they're like, a, it becomes a laboratory instead of a process of working together. This keys back to a very, very crucial um, concept in, in theatrical work, which is called safe space. Yeah? Um, and this is important around all kinds of play, is that you need, first of all, to establish a situation in which it's acceptable to do things that are unusual. Yeah? It's acceptable to, to mess up and fail. And one of the ways you can do that is by, at the, at the beginning, throwing everybody into a ga- game where they all mess up and they all laugh when they're doing it. Yeah? Or it can be by establishing authority, by having a physical space, which is shut off from the rest of the organization by closing the door, covering the windows, whatever you need to do. Yeah? But that's actually a, that is the art of making this stuff work, and especially making it work in delicate situations, is how do you set up safe space? And of course, there is a, a everything stays in this room codex for all consultancy work. I mean, that is very important. Um, uh, that, well, it depends uh, on what you're working on, but we, we decide as a group what comes out of the room. We, we decide as yeah. a group what comes out of the room. Yeah. And you say the observer syndrome. Uh, the way I, for instance, work with if there is a group where maybe 50% is, is introverts, I activate them by making them active observers. So you will have to look for this body language in that situation. You would have to look for that. So I, I give tasks so everybody would have to be engaged or ask questions directly afterwards very often when you are doing um the all at once rule is very important as well i mean we did some games here we asked some like some some volunteers to step up nobody was chosen by random or nobody was spotlighted you were invited to step up and then we could play but usually in a physical situation you'd make sure everyone's playing at once so no one's got time to watch anybody else that's that's really really important. Now make sure they all start at the same time and finish at the same time. Otherwise, some will drop out and become observers, and you have that problem. I'd like to really quickly go into the last question, then go on to our roundup. So I'm trying to finish on the dot of eight o'clock, as theatrical people try to do. Um, Four minutes. When is when should we not play this? Peter, do you want to go first? Or yeah, I go first. Well, uh, I think we touched upon the observer syndrome. We should not play when it's not a safe space mm. for playing. So by, if we haven't secured or established a safe space for people to play in, I don't think we should play in organizations, yeah, organizational settings. It's very important to have that transparently and set up. And also as a facilitator, be very transparent mm. about what's actually going on in the room as well during the play, if that safe space should crumble or whatever. I think another time not to... Not to- use play or if you do it do it very very gently is in situations where people are are in either deep shock or deep grief yeah so there are yeah. times where people psychologically are literally not open to take on new information or new behaviors uh, because they're processing something which is very very traumatic yeah um and in that context maybe just shutting up is really important but 
I spoke about my friend uh, Marine, who works in these rape, these awful, awful rape camps. Yeah, um, when he helps people very, very carefully to move from that stage into a next stage. There's a great organisation called Clowns Without Borders, uh, which is like Erste ohne Grenzen, Médecins Sans Frontières, which is an organisation of clowns that go around into refugee camps and so on, and they help people to laugh again. Yeah, usually by self-reflection and so on. Um, it's very delicate, um, but uh, I think it's surprising how often you can be playful. Yeah, doesn't mean you're not taking the thing seriously, but you're taking yourself less seriously. Take the problem seriously, take the audience seriously, and don't take yourself too seriously. And then you can be playful and very productive. I find. Peter, let's round up with the last few slides. Yeah, we've got like one minute. Can you share your screen one again? Slides. So, do you guys see that? Excellent. Okay, so I've got a quote here from uh, Sepp Herberger, the classic German uh, 1954 World Cup winning trainer. Yeah, and he said, "Nachten Spiel is Nachten Spiel is vor dem Spiel." So after the game is before the game. So we've been playing around today, and I hope you guys will be playing again. What? We, how can we connect those two things together? Um, I wanted to point out this one point that we mentioned a few times already. When you are choosing to play or when you are choosing somebody, maybe to bring somebody in to help you play, you should always be aware, are we now working on the team? Okay. Yeah? Or are we working on the work problem itself? That's right. So are we helping the team to develop this solution? Or are we actually, or to be better at developing solutions? Or are we actually working on the solution with them? Yeah. And a lot of the people who come in as play advisors only do the first part, which can be great. But if you want the second part, make sure that you talk to them first. And if you're choosing things in your head, separate between making the team fitter or making the person fitter and actually working on the problem. Be clear which one you want. This is our final slide. It's eight o'clock. I apologize going over by a few seconds. Um, this is us. Yeah. Uh, you can reach us on various contexts. I'm also very Googleable and so on. And at the bottom, we have uh, some communities that we suggest you guys connect with. Peter, I met you at the Applied Improvisation Network. What's that? Really quickly. Yes, we did. What, uh, that's a group of hundreds, actually thousands of people from all over the world who works with applied improvisation from, to all, from in organizations, therapy, entertainment, etc. Applying principles and tools from improvisation to all sorts of stuff. In, in design, in, in conflict design, resolution, all these kind of things. Leadership, training, etc. So it's a very broad range of people. I don't need to say much about Play 14 and Play for Agile because Pierre is here in the room and can tell you about those things. That was my first contact to the Agile context, uh, Play for Agile, but 10 years ago. Uh, really amazing communities and uh, context there. Look out I for have game a book link. Oh, sorry. Oh, Go on. For look, out for, just, oh. um, look out for game designer collectives, people who actually enjoy creating games. A very strong one in Copenhagen called the Copenhagen Game Designer Collective. Um, these are people who play around with building new games and by trying to do that you can learn a lot about play and how it works yeah and i think the fourth one is just get out there go onto a stage yeah go and find a local group that's doing theater and being playful whether it's improv or good old-fashioned amateur dramatics you will learn a lot from their way of working which we can apply almost everywhere peter that's it um we are past eight o'clock. So okay. I just want to say we're going to put a couple of links. I have a link for a book on how to use applied intro exercises in agile teams, if that's what you're longing for, for instance. Mm -hmm. cool. um, so that's it from us. Okay. So I'll stop sharing. Uh, we're not, I want to say thank you to Pierre for having us. Thank you for you guys for, for your patience and listening. Um, oh, I, dis I disappeared. Well, oh, thank, disappeared. You, uh, thank you so much having you here. Uh, it was a great session. Very <laughs> lovely. Uh, so we thank you all. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. So next.